I'm just going to do a brief talk about um, what we do in my company, which is basically wild collection and we also do some farming in coral. I'm going to talk a little bit about where we find the coral on the reef, so to give you guys an idea of everyone's got fish tanks which are full of corals from vastly different regions in the environment, so we'll go through a bit of that. And then we'll touch on a bit of our propagation and, and coral spawning, which we're doing, which is really quite exciting. Okay, so Bombsend Aquatics, my company, we started uh, 11 years ago in Darwin, um, and we've got a, a facility in Darwin which collects from the waters around the Northern Territory and more recently Western Australia. Uh, we also have a facility in Cairns where we work out of the Northern Great Barrier Reef, and we recently, last year, started one in Bumbert. So that basically gives us the biggest range of live coral and inverts in Australia, which is really exciting. Um, each of our facilities has Liverboard boats from 17 to 20 metres long, so we can spend a lot of time at sea and travel a lot of miles to get the best product we can. And it also helps us get the product back in the best condition. Uh, our Bundaberg facility is actually on the water, so we've got salt water on tap, which makes life really enjoyable. Um, so, a lot of people ask us what sort of filtration and plant equipment that we use in our facilities, and it's industrial but it's exactly the same as what you would use at home, but it's 20 times bigger. So but all, what we can see here is our facility in Bundaberg. Very simple, uh, thick protein skimmers. We've got ozone, we use an oxygen generator to, to help with that ozone. And then we just have sumps, just like every other home aquarium or that. And in those sumps, we use volcanic rock to filter our water. So there's no hidden secrets, there's no bells and whistles, it's very basic, but it works. And, and on the large scale that, that we operate, we find this is the most efficient way. So as I mentioned before, we operate out of Bundaberg, which services the Southern Great Barrier Reef, so that's where we get all our acans and scullies, uh, gold torch and all that sort of stuff. We operate out of cans, and in cans we get the acro, we get a lot of the, uh, what we call paddock stuff, which is desh and trachophilia and, and fungi and stuff. And then Darwin, we operate out the Northern Territory, and like I said, recently we, we're now venturing into Western Australia. So that's where our zoanthids, our crelomorphs, our giant clams, our branching hammer come from. So when you combine all three areas together, it's a huge, huge collection area that we, that we can play around in. So it's, um, there's always something new to find. But I want to touch on quickly the, the zones of a reef. So a lot of people, at home keeping your fish tank, you've got a, a very small fish tank and you've got corals from sometimes thousands of kilometres away and in totally different areas of the reef. So this is just to give you a quick insight on where we actually find the corals when we're out in the wild. So a, a general reef can be broken down into three zones, very general. There's always exceptions to this rule. Nature doesn't play by the one, two, three game, it does what it wants. But generally the reef tops is the surface of the reef where we've got massive waves breaking, it's often exposed at low tide to wind, to rain, uh, to higher temperatures. You've got the sloping reef, which slopes, as it suggests, slopes down from the reef top and, and sometimes there's a vertical wall or sometimes a very gradual slope. Generally down to 20 to 30 odd metres is where you're looking at the coral there. And then you have what's called the interreefing zone, which is basically big patches of mud or sand that is in between the reefs. And, and that's what we call paddocks because down there it's like a paddock of grass. There's often different types of sea grasses, philurpids, and then in amongst that mud you'll have vast areas of coral that you wouldn't expect to find. So first of all, the, the reef tops. Everyone's familiar with, with what you get from the reef top, which is Acropora. So Acropora generally is found in that high, high current zone, but it's not, a, it's not a, a pushing current, it's a pulsing current. It's where the waves are breaking, and there's a lot of surge pushing you back and forward. Um, the aquapora obviously likes a lot of light and a lot of foam, and that's because that's where it's found on the reef. Having said that, there are species of aquapora which we find in the deeper water, like the echinata, and they, and they do prefer different conditions. But in general, you'll find the acros up on top of the reef. Another thing you find up on top of the reef is giant clams. So uh, they love the bright sunlight, they can get exposed for hours on end and, and close up in the hot sun, get rained on a whole bit and they, they'll survive. 
Uh, a lot of people don't realize that soft poles are also up in that zone. A lot of soft poles will get exposed at low tide. They cover up with mucus to protect them like sunscreen, and then the tide comes up, they'll open their poles again. Uh, zoanthids, again, particularly in where we collect in Darwin, there's massive mats of zoanthids, almost as far as you can see, uh, and they're exposed at low tide. So they're, they're getting that rain, that sun, you know, they're huge variances in environment. So anything that's going to get exposed like that at low tide, usually pretty tough, a little bit more tolerant. Um, <clears throat> and Montipora, things like the Montes, the Cypastrians, the Rock of Pine, on the reef tops as well. So the reef tops for us is a fun place to dive because we can get a lot of bottom timing. It's only shallow water, so it's anywhere between two to six metres. And as collectors, we can spend all day in that area without having to worry about getting decompression sickness. So it's a really good place for us to explore. And also, these corals are often the fastest growing. So when we collect in an area, it, it regrows probably quicker than most of the corals that we're targeting, so we can go back to that sooner. So your reef slope. The reef slope is where a lot of your classic corals like your Euphilias, so your glabrescents, your anchoras, your para anchora, uh, your blastomusa, bronyopras, scolimaya, lobos, corellomorphs. You're going to find those once the reef starts to slope down, gets in some deeper water. There's less of a bashing wave down there and more of a pushing surge up. So it's still a lot of water movement, but it's, it's tidal. It's going one way with the tide and the other way uh, over four hour periods. And, and you know, you'll often find walls from here to that wall full of prelomorphs on those sloping reefs. Uh, they're very, very you know, diverse environments. And, and you know, you're going down the, the wall of a reef, and, and underneath a little rock, you'll see a piece of blastomosa, and it's pretty much in the dark. So, I'll, I, you know, a lot of these poles are very um, tolerant with different light levels. A lot of them don't actually like to be blasted by fully intense LEDs, they prefer a softer one. So as we go down the reef slope, we come down to about 20 metres in depth. Once you hit that sort of 20 metre mark and the reef tapers off, you keep swimming, you'll go into an area that's called the inter-reef zone. And that's, like I said before, we turn the caves. And, and that's vast areas of sand and mud and silt. And, and you can swim for hours on end trying to find that one patch. And once you find a patch of the right type of seagrass or, or polerpa, you start finding coral. So down there, you're getting your corals that just sit in the mud. So the ones that aren't physically attached to rocks. So you're talking about trachophilia, talking about heliofungia, they'll be sitting on the sand. Uh, your cataphilia, they'll sit in the mud. Um, and your fungia, obviously, just sit on the sand. And then acanthogea gesiana, we call them gesh, uh, or meat coral, I think some people call them. All these guys are just sitting down there on the mud. They're not attached to anything. So they've evolved over millions of years to, to actually be able to push sediment off their bodies. So they're always very fleshy. They, they have the ability to expand and, and even move. So the fungi you can actually move around and push the chitis and things off them. These guys are living in a, a quite a low light environment uh, with high nutrients. So in the, in the aquarium environment, they probably would benefit more from feeding than say your aquaporum to up top in the clean water. So all the detritus and stuff that comes down off the roof, these guys are chowing down on that. But this is a little bit of uh, a footage from me collecting off the Northern Territory. Just to give you an idea, we, we dive from hooker hoses, so we don't have tanks on our back. Uh, we have a little bailout bottle, which is in case the compressor stops. But this was quite a few years ago before I could afford bailout bottles. So I used this to go diving on the hose. And when you own the business, you can take more risks. Um, and what, what I'm doing here, so you can see around, this is a really healthy reef off the Northern Territory, absolutely loaded with Acropora, Montiporas, Parinies, there'll be giant clams in here you'll see. You'll see a reef shark swim by. There's Magnifica and enemies in this area. This is all about six to eight metres deep. So this is that top of the reef zone. In big swell, this was getting pummeled by waves, and I couldn't be working out here. This is quite um, a nice day for it. So we, you know, you hand select the piece of coral you're after. You're not taking a whole big piece, and 
gently you're just breaking it off from the base. It's like fragging. They're just fragging in the ocean. Um, and we'll, we'll select that piece for the, the colour and the size. And knock off the, the dead piece on the bottom. That aquapora has grown so big, half of it's dead. And then we'll pop that in our dive basket. And so we'll continue to do that over the period of 45 minutes to an hour, depending on our dive profile. And then as we fill each layer of the basket, we put some material down to protect the corals. And then once the basket's full, you come back to the boat and unload it, have a break and go back in again. So it's really enjoyable um, you know, work to do. And that, that's the best reef on the Northern Territory. I, full credit to the guys who dive up there now because the visibility is normally like half a metre at best. So you, you're diving in ice coffee almost. So that was a really good day. Only day we could film. That's a IT helmet or something. Sorry, my IT skills are hopeless. No, no coral and fish. All right, so that's basically our wildfire stuff. That's our facilities. That's the areas of the reef. And I'm just going to touch on now the, the new side of our business, which is coral propagation and, and farming. So. Uh, at Monsoon Aquatics, we've been um, producing giant clams for about three years now. So we do that out of the Northern Territory. Uh, we're producing uh, Tridacna maxima and Spumosa. We had a bit of a hiccup last year, and, and so we're, we're back a year in production, but that's all coming back online now, which is really exciting. But this is a, a photo of me injecting. I've got a very long needle, about 20, 30 centimetres long. Uh, that needle is full of serotonin, which is a, a feel-good hormone. We inject the gonad of the clam, which is where they have the eggs and the sperm. I inject that serotonin right into the gonad, and within five minutes they're spawning. And within that time, we're running around mixing the egg and the sperm into the exact ratio. If you put too much sperm into the eggs, the eggs just explode. So it's a, it's a mix between uh, science and art. You kind of look at it and go, oh yeah, that, this and that. There is no exact formula to follow when you're under the pump because you've only got 15 minutes to do it. After 15 minutes, the eggs aren't viable. The sperm's viable for a good hour, so the men last a lot longer in this case, but the, the, the eggs, the females, they're done 15 minutes. So you've got a very short window to actually you know, make it happen. So two days after, the, the three or four days in, they're like little, these little shells swimming around the water column. And then a month old, you actually see they're starting to look like clams. And after about six to eight months, you're getting a, a clam of about three to four centimetres. After a year, they're around the five centimetres and ready for sale. So that's the, the life cycle of the clam. And I could do a whole talk on them, there's way more to it. I'm simplifying it. Uh, these are some of our brood stock. So this is uh, the Maxima clams, and these are the Spermosa. Uh, these are the, the juveniles that we produce of this formosa. And I will say, like, all my broodstock plants are bright blue, really bright colours. And when you breed them together, you'd expect to get bright blue colours. No. You could get 20,000 and maybe 5% of them will be blue. The rest are all random colours. So there's a definite, if anyone's a scientist, there's a PhD in that huh, to figure out how you get the right colours in your, in your plants and your producer. Okay, so the other big thing we do at Monsoon Aquatics is your coral propagation. So you, you can see here at the Aquarium Industries booth, we've got our frags on display there. Um, there's a couple of other vendors here that have our, our frags and coral on as well. Uh, and, and this is an area that we're investing heavily into. Um, and it's not because the, the reef's dying and we, we can't keep doing what we're doing, it's to provide our customers with consistency. So we want to get more people into the hobby. And to go out and buy a hundred dollar piece of coral, for a lot of people is just out of the question. But to buy a twenty dollar frag to start out and, and wet your feet and, and figure out how to do it is a really good idea. So that's why we're that's where we're pitching to do our, our fragging. We want to get more people into this amazing hobby which we all love. Um, so we're fragging a range of LPS, soft corals, hard corals, nothing's off the table, and we're doing it in large volumes at a really reasonable price. Again, to encourage more people into the hobby. And yeah, we love it, it's great fun. It's really exciting to watch them grow from tiny little pieces ready for sale. 
magnificent uh, shot. So, you know, beautiful body operas, Blaster Musa, Star Pops, often over underrated coral. Every beginner should get into Star Pops because you get instant satisfaction because they bright and they, they look great. Um, and then, you know, we've got some A cans here and different Donnies and Albio Pora, hundreds of species of coral. And, and this is the most exciting thing that we've just started recently. Um, and that we're putting a lot of effort into is the, the coral spawning. So we've, we've done some euphilia in the Northern Territory before and we've had some success. And, and now we're doing euphilia in our Bundaberg operation because we have access to salt water. So it makes the aquaculture a lot uh, easier. And we have permits in, you know, in place in Darwin to, to aquaculture with plants and all that as well. Um, so what we've got here is Little video or so. So these are uh, the euphilia eggs fertilised. Jeff in the crowd here does that at Bundy. He knows a lot more about it than me, so I'm not going to steal the thunder. But basically, the, they're brooders. They release the eggs. Uh, we collect the eggs and then we settle them on the tiles and, and grow them out. So the euphilia is a pretty easy one to start with. And once we get this male, we'll move on to other species. And hopefully in the future, a large portion of what we can provide to our customers will be true, truly aquaculture coral, so sexually reproduced, not just propagated. So that's a really exciting space. So these guys here are about um, three months old, Jeff. So, uh, so these are three months old um, euphilias, and you can see that they've, they've got the mouth, they've got the pot, they've settled. So now the challenge for us is, well, how quickly can we grow them to get them ready for fish tanks and get them out of the market. So it's a really exciting space to be, to be working in. Again, loads of PhDs in this sort of thing if you're a scientist. Oh, that's it, thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. If you've got any questions, you can ask them now, formally, or you'll see us walking around in a couple of days, it's coming around us and have a chat. Thanks.